for the week of the 26th of January 2019, here's the Uni Blast. First up, let's look at what's coming out of the top 5 universities. 350 years ago, the Dutch old master Rembrandt died, leaving behind a rich body of paintings. However, over the next three and a half centuries, the lead paint he used has reacted to pollutants in the atmosphere, like sulphur dioxide, which has resulted in a thin white crust to appear on the paintings. So, in an effort to understand the process and aid in the preservation of his paintings and others like them, University College London used a process called X-ray diffraction computed tomography to analyse a sample they took from the painting. The sample, by the way, measured only 100 microns across, so it did minimal damage to the painting. The process gave the researchers a chemical fingerprint, and they saw that there was a large number of reactions happening throughout the layers of the painting. Sadly, the sulphur crust is too entwined with the painting to be removed, but the team hope they can carry this forward and later develop a means of preservation. Long-term pain from surgery or trauma can oftentimes severely limit someone's quality of life. But Oxford University has done some research and found that the natural killer cells that our body produces plays a large part in removing damaged nerves that cause lasting pain, and in turn allows healthy nerves to regrow. Lead author Alexander Davies mentioned how long-term nerve injury is an issue for modern medicine as there is no way to remove damaged nerves without causing more injuries. Now they will take this research forward from the mice they were using to human trials. They hope this new information will be carried forward to create a whole new range of drugs that help these natural killer cells get rid of damaged nerves and by doing so help reduce pain without the side effects of narcotics. Sounds like a pain in the neck but I hope it goes smoothly. All around the world, extreme weather is increasing, but could there be a pattern? Well, Imperial College London has looked at the world's extreme rainfall and found that there was often a link between them. One example of this is that five days after extreme rainfall in Europe, India often had extreme rainfall, but the countries in between did not. Lead author Dr. Bohr said that this research would be helpful in a myriad number of ways, from better predicting extreme weather events around the world to providing a baseline and filling in the gaps in the climate model. This will also aid humanitarian missions as they prepare for flash flooding or landslides. Co-author Professor Hoskins also said that this was a great example of the potential of complexity studies, which is a relatively young field of study looking at complex information that is difficult to relate to each other. In this example, it was complex networks and atmospheric science. Now to physics and engineering, and it was a good week to be a fan of black holes, as both Durham University and Dublin City University reveal a little more about these cosmic monsters. First up, Durham, who looked at using supermassive black holes to measure the growth of the universe and found that it might be growing more rapidly than previously thought. Supermassive black holes are also incredibly old, often being made just one billion years after the Big Bang. They also somewhat paradoxically give off light so intensely that we can see them across 13 billion light years into the furthest reaches of the universe. One explanation they had for this was that the density of dark energy was variable across the universe and could change over time. Meanwhile at Dublin City, they have been looking to understand how these supermassive black holes or quasars came into being in the first place. They revealed that in order to form, a galaxy had to be created extremely quickly so that the early stars were supplied by a large amount of hot gas, which then made it into a supermassive star. This star only lasts a short while though before collapsing and so a supermassive black hole is created. They noted that this turns a number of assumptions on its head and opens up a whole new area for research. Hopefully they'll shed further light on black holes in the future. For the past couple of years we have heard how renewable energy sources are becoming cheaper to produce and are overtaking fossil fuels for their return on investment. Well Dr. Raugai of Brooks University has just released a new paper which looks at the misconceptions that are plaguing the discussion, especially the notion of minimum energy return on investment. Dr. Raugai looked at a wide range of issues such as different supply chains, energy carriers, thermodynamic losses in transport and issues with them having a coherent methodology to study all of these together and could often lead to poor quality assumptions. The paper itself is even called Net Energy Analysis Must Not Compare Apples and Oranges. He finished up by saying that they must work hard to develop new, rigorous, detailed and consistently bounded scenario analysis. I wonder if the complexity studies we heard about from Imperial could help out here. Graphene's back once more, and this time it's the magnetic variant. Cambridge University has turned its attention to the material, also called iron trithiohypophosphate, and find that depending on pressure, it can change from insulator to conductor. This form of graphene comes from a family of materials called van der Waal materials. It has the same ultra-thin properties of graphene while also being magnetic. 
Dr. Haynes, the lead author, noted how magnetism in two dimensions is almost against the laws of physics. He then went on to say that they are creating a solid theoretical understanding that will later be used to create any number of devices. He finished up by saying, Our work points to an exciting direction for producing two-dimensional materials with tunable and conjoined electrical, magnetic and electronic properties. The more we learn, the more interesting graphene becomes. Now to everything that's happening with the human body. Do you remember that episode of The Simpsons where Homer's brother makes the baby translator? Well, that hasn't been invented. However, the University of Manchester has taken part in an international collaboration and discovered that from the age of three days old, babies are already able to pick up on individual words when adults speak. The ability to do this is based upon two mechanisms that they discovered. The first, called propsody, which is the melody of language which allows us to tell when words begin and end. The second is called the statistics of language, which looks at how often words are spoken. This leaves me wondering, when adults baby talk to babies, does this interrupt those mechanisms? Say you want to develop a habit, whether that's better eating, going to the gym, or maybe writing the script for a 12 minute YouTube show that doesn't go on for two days. Well, University of Work may just have found out a new way to help us. Their new study looked at how even if you hate doing something, just repeating it for long enough will train your brain. The way they researched this was through the use of digital rodents who had a choice between two levers. They find that even if the reward for pressing the lever was swapped out to the other, the habit had been formed and they stuck to the action as they had done so many times before. Next up they will take this research to the real world and try it out on some humans. Warwick pointed out that this could be a particularly interesting piece of research for those with obsessive compulsive disorder or any number of tick disorders. Remember the ice bucket challenge? It was for a condition called ALS or amyotropic lateral sclerosis, which is a form of motor neuron disease. But now, University of Sheffield researchers might just have made a breakthrough. They have identified a molecule which helps to protect the nerves from large electrical discharge cascades that fry the nerves. Called MIR4943P, this strand of microRNA regulates the genes that maintains the neuron's axons, the part that carries the electrical signal. And when added to astrocytes, a star-shaped cell found in the brain and spinal column, it improved the neuron survival significantly. The research has a long way to go, as we don't yet fully understand how this disease works, but they are hopeful that even by understanding this, new therapies could be developed. Now it's off to the natural world, and it seems like our influence extends ever further. Humanity's use of antibiotics over the last 100 years or so has created a group of so-called superbugs, and now the genes that make those bugs resistant has been found in the last pristine environments of Earth. Originally, this antibiotic resistant gene was found in South Asia, but has now been found in the Arctic. This is a big deal due to the Arctic being the last place we could find bacteria that didn't carry antibiotic resistance. Now, that is no more. Also, the fact that in three years, antibiotic resistant genes have traveled from surface water in India to the frozen tundra of the Arctic shows just how global of an issue this is. The team took 40 core samples from eight different locations and found genes that resisted nine major antibiotic classes. Professor Graham noted that humanity has supercharged the evolution of these bacteria against the drugs we use. The World Health Organization has placed superbugs on their list of the top 10 threats to global health for 2019. Within Buddhism, there is a practice known as live release, where captive animals or those destined for slaughter are released back into the wild. But Bournemouth University has released new guidelines to reduce potentially damaging side effects of releasing non-native species into the wild. The authors acknowledge that the practice was expressly about conserving the creatures and maintaining humane standards. The guidelines they suggest is that the animals they release are 1. Native to the region 2 are of similar genetics to those around them to prevent dilution of locally adaptive strains. Three, released in numbers that won't dominate the ecosystem. And four, won't disrupt the ecosystem, for example, through changing sediment. So for any Buddhists or conservationists out there, just be careful. Now for a look back in time and at ourselves, it's history and sociology. Vikings traveled far and wide, and that made them the perfect carriers for disease. And Queen's University Belfast University of Southampton and the University of Surrey have found new evidence that it was they who brought leprosy to Ireland. The team analysed a number of skeletons from around the island and found two different strains of leprosy in an individual from Dublin, one from the Middle East and one from Scandinavia. Chemical analysis of the bones also revealed that the individuals probably didn't grow up in the region and were travellers from Scandinavia. 
Ireland is an interesting microcosm for the history of leprosy, as it was never really impacted by the Romans or the Anglo-Saxons, giving it a nice time capsule feel. This knowledge helps fill in our gap around this disease and its spread during the medieval time. A centuries old religious enigma has finally been solved thanks to a student at the University of St Andrews. Johnny Woods was able to crack the shorthand used by the Baptist leader Andrew Fuller thanks to the copy of the confession that was printed in a biography. The text shine a light on how Andrew Fuller was able to rise so rapidly within the Baptist's ranks. Johnny was put to the task by Dr Stephen Holmes, who himself is a Baptist. Dr Holmes said, to be reading words of his that no one has read since he preached them in 1782, it's one of those moments you live for as an academic. The texts are now under consideration for publication and Dr Holmes is hoping to release a full critical analysis of the texts. The idea of buying a CD in this day and age seems kind of ridiculous, but for classical music fans it remains the quintessential way to listen. Thanks to the University of Sheffield and the Lucerne University of Applied Sciences in Switzerland who looked at their listening habits, it can be seen that CDs are twice as popular as iTunes and Spotify. YouTube, however, is seen to be extremely popular, but it seems the most weight is carried by classical critics. Fans expect their critics to be well-informed, passionate, respectful, open-minded, as well as witty and inspirational. And they expect that the reviews should be based on clearly grounded reasons instead of normative statements, such as those beginning with should, would, could, or must. So classical music fans are discerning in an evidence-based way, so it's not just about the opinion of elites. Well that's the highlights this week, but please remember to subscribe for more highlights each week. And before we get to the end finally, if this is something you would like to see expand and grow, please consider donating to the Patreon link below. The University of Nottingham have discovered that under UV light, a puffin's beak glows. So already this is pretty adorable, but in order to test this, they had to make special sunglasses for the puffins to wear, as UV radiation can damage eyes. This apparently was quite the ethical conundrum for a while, and it was only when Goldsmith University of London developed the special sunglasses from foam and waterproof neoprene that the experiment could go ahead. It's thought that glowing beaks could have a range of uses, such as acting as a signal during breeding season, or helping chicks identify their parents in low light. Or potentially puffin raves. And with that, I'll say goodbye.